How do we know, truly know, what the best diet is for a longer, healthier life? Well, instead of guessing, we can engineer the best diet from first principles thinking. First principles thinking cuts through the noise by focusing on the most basic truths. And when we get this right, we can add 7.3 healthy years to our life. In this video, I'll reveal three foundational principles that make achieving this goal not just possible, but straightforward. And if you want weekly health research summaries and health strategies that I share with my patients, sign up using the link in the pinned comment. The first foundational principle is this. We need to ensure that we're getting all of the essential vitamins and minerals that our bodies need. But that's a lot harder than many realize, and the impact of falling short is more serious than we usually assume. Let me explain. There are lots of things that our body need to maintain health that it can't make itself. And this includes vitamins like vitamin A and E, and minerals like zinc and iron. Vitamins and minerals perform a range of functions, from helping us to build new cells and producing hormones. Deficiencies can lead to serious health conditions, and even in extreme cases, death. So whatever else we're focusing on when it comes to our diet, we need to make sure that we're getting these essential nutrients. But that's not easy and the consequences are significant. So let me give you an example. Potassium has been identified by the US Dietary Guidelines as a nutrient of public health concern. This is for two reasons. The first is that people aren't getting enough, and the second is that a deficiency causes real problems. So how much are we supposed to get, and how short are we falling? Well, the recommended daily intake for potassium for adults is 4,700 milligrams. But according to data from 2012, the average American only gets about 2,640 milligrams per day, and 97% of the population aren't getting enough. A more recent study found that potassium levels have steadily been declining, with rising levels of serious deficiencies. And this isn't just a problem in the US. The standard Western diet, which is common all over the world, virtually guarantees that we won't get enough potassium. But why is this a problem? Well, too little potassium can increase blood pressure, kidney stone risk, and the amount of calcium that ends up in our urine, and that can lead to a deficiency in calcium as well. The blood pressure connection is particularly important. We know that risks for heart attacks and strokes go up significantly with blood pressure. As blood pressure goes up, so too does deaths. So how significant is the impact of potassium? Well, a meta-analysis examined the results of 22 randomized controlled trials, and the researchers discovered that increased potassium intake reduces systolic blood pressure by about three and a half points. Systolic blood pressure is the higher number that you'll see when you get your blood pressure measured. And look at what happens when potassium intake reached three and a half thousand to 4,700 milligrams. The reduction in blood pressure is an amazing seven units. So how much does that change matter? Well, a systematic review of studies on blood pressure and cardiovascular risk show some eye-opening numbers. Clinical trials show a reduction of blood pressure by just 10 units cuts the risk of coronary heart disease by 22% and strokes by a whopping 41%. So we can see that getting enough potassium is critical, but few manage to do so. Another example is magnesium. The US Nutritional Survey data indicates about half of Americans get less magnesium from their diet than they should, and a magnesium deficiency is associated with increased risks of obesity, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. And this is why I included both potassium and magnesium in microvitamin. But just because I take a supplement does in no way mean that you should as well. So what are the implications for our diet? Well, we want to prioritize foods that are packed with vitamins and minerals, and we especially want to prioritize foods that are a good source of potassium and magnesium, as well as other hard-to-get nutrients. So what foods fit that description? Fresh fruits, vegetables, legumes are all stars when it comes to nutrient density. Spinach and other leafy greens, broccoli, lentils and chickpeas are all excellent sources of potassium and other essential nutrients. But those foods are low in other nutrients like iron and B12. So does that mean that we need to include animal products as well? Well, before we answer that question, we need to talk about protein. This is the second fundamental principle that we can use to engineer the perfect diet. We need to get adequate protein and here's why. And we'll talk about what counts as adequate later in the video. Proteins are made up of amino acids, and amino acids are the building blocks. We need them to create and repair muscles, skin, bones, and other tissues throughout the body. Amino acids are also necessary to produce hormones, to create neurotransmitters, and to maintain the immune system. Like essential vitamins and minerals, there are some amino acids, called essential amino acids, that the body cannot make itself. So we need to get the nine essential amino acids from the proteins that we eat. So where can we get protein in our diet? Well, meat is a particularly good dense source of protein, as are eggs and dairy. 
For example, 100 grams of chicken breast contains 32 grams of protein, but plants can also be great sources of protein. So for example, 100 grams of chickpeas contains 19 grams of protein. But how much protein do we really need in our diet? And what else do we have to factor in when selecting the best protein sources for the perfect diet? Well, the baseline recommendations for protein, the recommended dietary allowance, stands at 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight or 0.36 grams per pound. But that's just the baseline. In other words, the minimum amount that we need. But there are good reasons to think that more would be helpful. So for one thing, high protein diets help us maintain a healthy weight. They help us feel fuller for longer and stimulate the body to burn more calories. But there's a second reason that high protein diets work in our favor. A growing body of evidence suggests that as muscle strength declines, total death rates increase. And on average, human muscle mass declines by about 1% per year from the age of 40. So therefore, to prevent muscle loss, we want to maximize our muscle strength in youth, maintain that muscle strength in middle age, and minimize the loss as we get older. And we know from multiple lines of evidence that as protein intake increases, so too does the response to exercise. This means that we gain more muscle from the same amount of exercise if we increase protein intake, up until a point of course. And that point seems to be about 1.6 grams of protein intake per kilogram of body weight per day. Protein intake above that level didn't seem to offer any further benefits in terms of the body's response to exercise. So far then, we want a diet that helps us to reach our recommended daily intakes of vitamins and minerals, particularly focusing on potassium and magnesium. And we also want a diet that's high in protein to maximize the benefits of exercise. But where should we get our protein? Should we get it from animal sources or plant sources? Well, an interesting study in 2020 found that when people ate more protein, overall death rates went down. This reinforces the idea that higher protein diets are probably better for our health. But the same study found that this relationship was even stronger for plant-based proteins. This could be because animal proteins come along with other things that we don't want, such as saturated fat. But there's good reason to at least consider adding fish to our diet. And that's because they are another source of an essential nutrient, omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3s play a critical role in brain function, heart health, and inflammation regulation. So to sum up, even if a person chooses to eat a vegetarian diet, one meat that that person might consider adding is fish for its omega-3s, as well as for its B12 content. Personally, I prioritize plant sources of protein because they help me avoid saturated fat, but they also help me follow a third key principle of a healthy diet, which we'll look at next. This third principle is a bit different than the other two. So vitamins, minerals, and proteins are all essential. We can't live without them. But now we're going to look at something that isn't essential, but the data shows us that it's really helpful. And as we'll see, prioritizing it makes a lot of sense to satisfy the first two principles as well. So remember the study that we just looked at, that the protective effects of high-protein diets were strongest with plant-based proteins. Well, after examining the evidence, the study authors concluded that this wasn't because those eating plant proteins were getting less fat, Something else seems to be going on. But what? Well, part of the answer likely has to do with fiber. So fiber is the part of plants that our bodies can't digest and it appears to have beneficial effects on a number of different fronts, from appetite regulation to gut health. And we have multiple lines of evidence that high fiber diets reduce a number of serious health risks. So for example, a massive meta-analysis published in The Lancet links higher fiber intakes with a 15 to 30% decrease in deaths from all causes, as well as from heart disease and strokes. Increased fiber intake can also help with weight loss. So for example, researchers found that eating an extra 14 grams of fiber per day was associated with a 10% decrease in calories consumed. This led to a weight loss of 1.9 kilograms, which is about 4 pounds, over 3.8 months. Looking at the available data, it appears that the more fiber a person eats, the more benefits they receive, up until a point, of course. While fiber is generally great, too much can cause digestive issues like constipation and bloating, so it's important to listen to your body. And to add further nuance to this conversation, people with irritable bowel syndrome might actually need a low-fiber diet. There's no one-size-fits-all diet, but in general, for the population, a higher-fiber diet is great. But most of us who live in Western countries are getting far too little fiber from our diets. On average, we need to increase our fiber intake by about 50% to reach the recommended levels, which is about 30 to 35 grams per day. And there's a huge bonus to targeting fiber-rich foods. They tend to be the very same foods that are great sources for plant protein and essential vitamins and minerals. 
Here's a great way to visualize this that will help us apply these three principles to engineer the best diet for a healthy life. So imagine the three principles that we've talked about so far as circles. Each circle represents foods that are great sources of what each principle says we should target. So we've got foods that are rich in vitamins and minerals, foods that are high in lean protein, and foods that are full of fiber. And when these three circles overlap, we'll find foods that give us all three things at once. So what kinds of things are in that area of overlap? Well, the top options are legumes. These include lentils, chickpeas, black beans, and edamame. These superfoods are the foundation of a best diet starting from the fundamentals. And researchers have even tried to quantify the impact of prioritizing those types of foods in our diet. So one massive study concluded that adding them can add up to two and a half years of life expectancy. Other great foods in the area of overlap include things like Brussels sprouts, quinoa, avocados, almonds, pistachios, and chia seeds. Foods in the overlapping area are best, but there are plenty of other great choices that might have two of the things that we want to target without having all three. Fish, for instance, has plenty of protein and is also packed with nutrients like vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus, iron, magnesium, and potassium. Any fresh fruit or vegetable is also likely to be a great choice. Now, you may have noticed that we haven't talked much about typical topics that usually come up when referring to diets, so carbs and fats. And these are because, aside from omega-3 fats, neither carbs or fats are technically essential. This is why people sometimes follow a low-fat diet or a low-carb diet such as keto. So how do carbs and fats fit into a healthy diet? Well, let's start with carbs. Are they a problem? Well, the simple answer is no. In fact, the same study that we just looked at found that eating the right kinds of carbs is associated with living a longer life. So what are the right kinds? Well, whole grains are a great place to start. This includes things like oats, brown rice, and quinoa. But what we definitely want to avoid is processed carbs, like white flour and especially sugar. Research has found that increased sugar intake is linked to an elevated risk of death from cardiovascular disease. What about fats? Well, an interesting point here is that the type of fat matters. We know that trans fats and saturated fats have negative health impacts. On the other hand, unsaturated fats have been linked to improved health. So for example, one study found that higher olive oil intake was associated with decreased risks of death and 19% lower risks of heart disease, 17% lower risks of cancer, and 29% lower risks of diseases for the brain and nervous system. And while we're talking about things to avoid, we also need to mention salt. So our bodies need a little, but so many of us get way too much, and elevated salt causes our blood pressure to rise. So we can use the three things that I've talked about to create another diagram. However, this time, it shows us the foods that we should avoid. And these foods are high in saturated fat, high in refined carbs, and high in salt, which are the worst for our health. So this would include things like highly processed foods, packaged desserts, pizza, and similar foods. Earlier in the video, we looked at nutrients that are hard to get enough of in a typical diet. And another one that we didn't discuss is vitamin D. So make sure to check out this next video here to learn what is the best way to take it and why combining it with vitamin K2 is exploding in popularity.